So uh, Joe will be back next week. I'm sure everybody's looking forward to that. And uh, this week is going to be, again, kind of like a Bible study, a topical Bible study. You know, last week, we, we talked about uh, why are we still here. This week, I'd like to talk about man's most challenging sin. And I no longer have the excuse that the dog ate my glasses because I got a new pair. Yay! Dollar fifty at ninety nine cent store. Why would they sell you a pair of glasses for a dollar fifty at a ninety nine cent store? I don't know. Uh, so I want to start by getting some ideas because there really is no perfect answer for this, and depending on what verse you look up or how you want to judge it. But what is man's most challenging sin? Well, I'm going to uh, clarify that a little bit. And we'll, we'll call, we'll say this is the religious man's most challenging sin. What is the religious man's most challenging sin? Mm. Pride. 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 Uh, again, there's no right answer. There's a lot of answers, and mine, what I'm going to talk on might be just slightly different than what you're saying, but I hope it fits a lot of what, what, what you're going to answer. Other than that, other than pride. Self-centered? Self-centered. Self-centered. <laughs> Coming dangerously close to the way I said it. <laughs> Coveting. Uh, coveting? Okay. What else? Idolatry. Idolatry. Very good. Idolatry. Self righteous. Self righteous. Hmm. I didn't think anybody would actually say that. <laughs> But you, you, that's, that's what I'm going to talk about. Lazy. And I'll put it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Lazy? Oh. Laziness. Oh. Yeah, laziness. You're hitting close to home there. <laughs> <laughs> Self-righteous. Mm -hmm. Self-righteous. Mm -hmm. Self-righteous. Mm -hmm. Self-righteous. As, you, as you're well aware, of course, when, whenever you prepare for one of these things, it points more at yourself than anything else, right? Mm -hmm. the, so it's always a challenge. Self-righteous. Judgmentalism. Judgmental. That fits uh, well into the. Uh, and you said I look at myself. I thought, oh yeah, that's right. That's that's what I'm supposed to look. Into the self righteousness to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same, same thing. And it doesn't have to be along the lines of self righteous. If you have another idea, shout it out. All right. Well, I think we've captured <laughs> a, a good number of them. Would you mind handing these out? What I'd like to address is, is <clears throat> self-righteousness. None of us in the OPC suffer from self-righteousness, do we? Yeah, I mean, we, 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 we never think of ourselves better than someone else. And I drive home from work and, and uh, drive through some area between Torrance and here and see people on the street that uh, obviously have done some interesting drugs or something in their lifetime. And they're, they're on the street corner and doing curious things. And I always think to myself, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm lower than that, right? It, isn't, that's tough sometimes, isn't it? When you, when you see people that are really lost and it, it's tough to come up with your first thought being there, but for the grace of God go I. But it's true. We know it's true. If we think about it, we might. But, uh, you know, it's, it's not always the first thing we think about. So let's take a look at what the Bible says about self-righteous attitude. And even though I have my glasses, I would really appreciate 
uh, not only your comments, but folks reading uh, some of these verses. So would someone look up Romans 2.1, please? And at the same time, <clears throat> excuse me, if someone could look up Romans 10.3, and I'm going to ask you to read verses 1 through 4. And if someone could look up Galatians 6.3. I'll take the Galatians one. Okay, who's taking 2-1 or who has 2-1? Go. Wendy, go ahead. Uh, just 1 or 1 through 4. Well, go ahead and do 1 through 4, please. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same thing. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things, and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and his forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to be led, meant to lead to your repentance? It's one of those kind of verses that just floors you, right? And think, oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> We, we all tend to be, occasionally, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, a little bit judgmental. We look at other folks and say, I would never do that. Well, yeah, not only would you, you did in some manner or, in, uh, uh, some manner or other, right? It's, it's, it's such a challenge for us uh, to not be judgmental. And God is very, very clear about us being judgmental. Uh, Romans 10, 3, and uh, let's read verses 1 through 4 there also. Go ahead, Mike. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge since they do, did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Thank you. So we know <clears throat> one of the ways in your own mind that you can, you can become convinced that a God exists is the fact that we as humans have an innate feeling of right and wrong. No, I mean, C.S. Lewis goes into this pretty deeply in the, his book, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Mere Christianity. That, and and he's, he's making an argument to people that uh, are, are not necessarily believers. He said, but you know, how can you say that there is no God or that there's a God that doesn't uh, impact us when we as humans have an innate idea of right and wrong. If somebody came and stole your car, would you say, oh, well, you know, that's their right to do that. If they can, if they can figure out how to do it, it's their right to go ahead and take it. I mean, frankly, I, I have two dogs and that's the way they act. If you get away with stealing my food, that's my fault, right? I should have chopped your nose off with but, and they do. Sometimes the one dog catches the other dog trying to steal his food, and then, then there's a problem. Uh, but, but we don't feel that way as a society, right? If somebody steals our car, we not only feel like we've been wronged, we realize that there's a society back there that's going to back us up in that feeling, right? And we go get some law officers to help us out with that situation. But there, there's just an innate feeling, and, and all of us feel that way, right? If something's been taken from us, if something's been, if we've been wronged in somehow, we feel like we should be able to get our brothers and sisters. Not, not, and I'm not speaking religiously now, or, or from a Christian standpoint, just, but other humans to agree with us and to help us uh, right that wrong. So, it's we're different from animals. We, we, everyone, I think believes in right and wrong, but do we all see it as God's righteousness? And I sometimes, challenge me on these things if, if you think I'm going astray, but I sometimes think that one of the reasons God put the Israelites 
as his people in the way that he did is to is to give us a lesson in being very, very careful about our self-righteousness, be very, very careful about creating a church that's based on what we think is the right thing to do and setting up our own set of rules. You know, every, every culture's got a little bit of that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've been to a number of different churches and some have different ways in which they interpret the Bible. For example, uh, one of our brother churches is the RCUS, the, the Reformed Church in the United States. And Shannon and I went to one of those churches when we were in Mobile. It was a very good church, very good Christian people. But don't think about having a picture of Jesus anywhere. Don't think about buying a Bible that might have a, a children's Bible that might have a picture of Jesus on it, or Moses, or Abraham, or a picture of anybody, because it's wrong. And, and so some, sometimes we add to uh, shall I say, what's in the Bible a little bit. And and as OPCers, we possibly add it to what's in the Bible occasionally. <coughs> but here's our interpretation of it. So even though the word's not exactly clear, we think it's this way. So it's wrong for people to do this differently, right? So, um, sprinkling and dunking. <laughs> sprinkling and dunking may be a, a, a good example. Of that, right? What do we think is right? Well, Well, I can show you in Ezekiel Ezekiel 35, I think, where, where they, the Bible talks about sprinkling. And then somebody else might say, oh, yeah, but I've looked up the true meaning of baptism, and the true meaning of baptism is immersion. Oh, all right, so let's have this argument, right? So we just have to be a little bit careful and, and, and be a little bit careful that we're not self-righteous, as Paul points out in Romans, that his brother Israelites were. All right, who had Galatians 6.3? I, I have that here. Um, or if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Are you saying that I deceive myself? No, I, I do that for myself. <laughs> I deceive myself so many times. It's just, it's just oh, crazy. Yeah. You, know? you have to be very careful. So this self-righteousness we're talking about, uh, well, let's say it. Let me reverse it. Righteousness that comes from God goes hand in hand with true humility. So vice versa, self-righteousness goes hand in hand with pride. We think we're right and and, and we think we have a form of self-righteousness there. So so pride, uh, of course, which I think was number one, yeah. that, that fits right into this whole self-righteousness. But let me flip this around a little bit now. So it sounds like I'm criticizing righteousness. We have to be a little bit careful because righteous living is critical. So how do we differentiate? So if somebody could look up Proverbs 21, 21 for me. And someone else look up Matthew 6, 23. And of course you could argue all of Matthew 23, but I we're not going to read all of Matthew 23. So someone look up Matthew 23, just verses 29 through 33. By the way, if you want a chance to take a deeper look into self-righteousness and God's response to that, just read the book of Job. We're not going to go through the whole book of Job here, but read the book of Job and especially those last chapters where where uh, Job actually argues for his own righteousness mm -hmm. and God sets him straight and then he <laughs> repents. Uh, e even though, you know, we can all say that if what happened to Job happened to us, we would, I would have a little bit of maybe a self-righteous attitude. Like, mm -hmm. why did this happen to me? Why, what did I, I didn't do anything to deserve this, right? And that, and that was a little bit of Job's, Job's attitude towards God. Anyway, let's take a look at these verses specifically, because if I get off on Job, we'll, we'll be way off target here. Uh, Proverbs 21, 21. Are we to live righteous lives? Yes. Whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life, righteousness, and honor. Okay, so we are to pursue righteousness. We just have to be careful 
what kind and uh, who has Matthew, Matthew 6.23. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Did I write down something wrong here? I must have written down something wrong. Uh, in fact, I know what it is. I, I'm pretty sure that's Matthew 5. I apologize. Give me just a second here to see if I can fix that. I'll have to uh, give it some more thought. I knew. So anyway, let's let's move right to Matthew twenty-three. And you, I, I can tell you what I was aiming for with Matthew 6, 23, and that was it's not a righteousness that comes from our own. So I'll have to take a look uh, and, and figure out what verse that is. But let's take a look at Matthew 29 uh, and take a look at just a portion of Jesus' condemnation of, of the Pharisees because of their self-righteousness. Who has uh, Matthew 23, 29? What do you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? For you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up, then, the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you escaping sentence to hell? So this is always just a little bit disturbing, too. These guys were good religious guys, right? I mean, they, they, you could you could say that they were very similar to the structured church of today, uh, right? Uh, maybe not exactly, but but the, the the Pharisees were the religious leaders, and not only the religious leaders, but we're not talking about religious leaders of some heathen religion. We're talking about religious leaders of God's chosen people, the, the, the Israelites. Uh, uh, now, of course, I say God's chosen people. Even, even Jesus says, or, or that, that uh, or, or I'm sorry, Paul said, not all the Israelites are Israelites, right? Not, not all the chosen Israelites are actually chosen Israelites. Uh, but... Nonetheless, Jesus is really tough on, on the Pharisees. And I think that gives us a, a, a very good insight. That Jesus gives us a few examples of what he means by self-righteousness. So let's, let's take a look at those so we can get a better perspective of God's uh, revealed nature and, and the grace shown to the self-righteous uh, you know who, who does god uh who does jesus actually interact with and how does he interact with them on this earth so let's take a look at a, a few things let's take a look at uh, the the um, situation in simon's house when jesus came to to eat with simon Luke uh, 7, 36 through 39. I can do that. Yeah, go ahead. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment and standing behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears 
and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Well, was the man a prophet? Did he know? Mm -hmm. Yes, he knew full well. And, and should that give us insight into how we should deal with sinful people, perhaps? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, Jesus went out of his way to reach the sick, right? And that's, uh, that's basically what he said as the great physician to, to the, the Pharisees. You know, I'm, I'm not here to heal those who are uh, well, but to heal those that, that are sick. And so as individuals and as a church, our, our job is to reach out to sinners. And that's a challenging one. Uh, you know, you can, you can readily get uh, a, a bad reputation by hanging around with folks that uh, society looks down upon, right? Uh, so what should we be doing as a church? How should we be dealing with that? And, and I often wonder about that, you know, how, how are we really doing as a modern church? Are we really doing what God intends us to do? I'm not saying we aren't. I'm just saying it's, it's something that I, I question in my mind. You know, we, we tend to uh, tend occasionally to be separatists, right? We tend to say, well, you know, we, we do things a certain way. And if, if you want to come join our group, you have to learn to do things that way and, and not uh, some of that certainly is living the righteous life as we as we learned in Proverbs that we are supposed to do but uh, we are also supposed to have our doors open to sinners I think and, and, and I think Jesus makes that very clear here um, in the end what did he do with the woman which caused so much trouble uh, in the minds of the Pharisees you know, led to the blaspheme charge, right? Uh, what, what did Jesus do? What did he say to the woman? Forgive her sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, their sins are forgiven. <clears throat> uh, and, and, and so, uh, you, you know, that, that's, that's what really raised the ire of, of the, uh, the, the Pharisees. Here's another tough one. How, how did Jesus treat those that society had given up on completely. Somebody who's, who was considered so evil and so far beyond uh, society's norms and help that society had pretty much given up and, and said, well, that, that person's just evil. We just have to protect <coughs> ourselves from that person. And, and, uh, uh, and, and Jesus' attitude was completely different. So somebody look up for me, uh, uh, please, Mark 5. In fact, in order to uh, keep it a little bit shorter, and I can, I can see that my time estimate is not, not as careful as it was last week because I'm going much faster than uh, I expected. But let's take a look up uh, Mark. Can somebody Mark read five. Mark 5, 1 through 13? And then somebody else look up 18 through 20, if you would. Go ahead. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit. And he lived among the tombs. And no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched those chains apart, and that he broke the shackles in pieces. And no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day... <coughs> Among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment, torment me. And he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. 
and he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. And now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. And so Jesus gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. So this, this story, and, and help me out if, if you feel differently, please, but you read this story and it's just so fantastic. You think, could that possibly have been true? Did that really happen? And how would you react? How would I react if I were there at that story? And I sometimes wonder, would I be like the people in that town? Do you remember what the people in the town asked Jesus to do? Leave. Leave. Go away. It's so um, against cultural and societal norms to not only uh, entertain somebody who's clearly demon-possessed like that, because that, that, that probably makes us a little bit nervous, right? Uh, but, but then to actually do something about it and, and do something about it that impacts the, the uh, uh, economic welfare of that, that, uh, that local community. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a challenge. And, and so when I, whenever I think that perhaps we as a society um, are doing a good job in dealing with those who are troubled, uh, and, and I, I, I'm not going to uh, be the one to predict or, or to, to actually uh, suggest that they're demon possessed or not, but some people that are that, that have uh, mental troubles, and, and what should we be doing? What, you know, people that are clearly troubled internally, according to the norms of our society, what should we be doing? And, and it's a uh, it's a real challenge and you read what Jesus did and you, you think, boy, we, we should be doing more because uh, the example is clearly there. What happened then uh, to this man? So who has 18 through 20? As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. Everyone marveled. I, I know I would have marveled. This, here's a man who was basically considered beyond all help. I mean, they had shackled him a number of times and things didn't work out. They, 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 clearly the society was scared of him and he just changes completely through the power of uh, Jesus Christ. And, and sometimes I have to admit that I, I, I uh, don't think dwell on that power when, you, when you're dealing with people that are beyond what you feel comfortable with dealing with. Do, do you ever realize that no you know, do you ever think the power of Jesus Christ is so much more powerful than these people, than, 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 than the troubles that we deal with on this earth? And, and, and allow that, allow yourself to be comforted by the power of Jesus Christ and what he can do. Uh, not only uh, did he uh, deal with this man directly, but clearly uh, this man was a different man when this whole thing was over, when the, when the demons had been uh, removed from him, he was ready to serve Jesus Christ. And he did so in a way that marveled the community. All right, and finally, uh, let, let's take a look at this thief on the cross. Um, somebody take a look up Luke 23, 39. The thief on the cross. I mean, how, how, how much more can you, how much greater can you conceive of someone who is beyond all help? Society has reje rejected him, this person, because of their evil deeds. And, and uh, uh, this person is going to lose their life because of their evil deeds. Um, 
is isn't that a person that's just beyond help? Isn't that a person mm -hmm. who's who's you know they they've done it to themselves and and we got to feel absolutely no uh, uh, remorse. We're just we're just ridding society of a of, of a, a major wart uh, uh, that that's uh, causing a problem. So somebody read the uh, Luke twenty three. And let's see how, see what Jesus' reaction was to this man. Uh, it's 23 th from verse 39 through the end of the chapter. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Say yourself to us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do not fear God. Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, so we are receiving the due rewards of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Thank you. To continue, but uh, that's the end of the paragraph. Um, the end of the chapter, yeah, <clears throat> you know, I, that, I think that covers. I think let me let me take a quick look at it. Yes, that's all I want. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't want to go on to the end of the chapter. That that gets quite quite involved there, doesn't it? Um, so let's take a look at these, uh, just a quick review of the, these three. It, it almost sounds as though I'm condemning any form of, uh, uh, uh of righteousness at all. And, and, and I, I must say that I'm not, I'm not even saying that Jesus was only here to deal with the sinful uh, and the, the people that society had rejected, because we're going to look at some incidents where he's looking not at people society had rejected, but also people that that uh, were, were self-righteous. And he had Jesus love and grace and mercy goes beyond uh, just those who are clearly rejected by society and goes even to those who had a form of, of self-righteousness. So I, I read that and say, well, there, there's, there is some hope for the church, even for those who are self-righteous. Jesus Christ, grace, goes, goes, reaches out to all. And so I'm not, I'm not trying to say that we ha don't have to be careful. We have to be careful. We have to be careful <laughs> about uh, ignoring the uh, message of Jesus Christ and replacing that with what I'll call just religious play, uh, re religious sayings or 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 or, or uh, su superficial uh, religious actions, uh, but still there's hope for those who are self righteous. So the first one I like to look at is Nicodemus. Who was Nicodemus? Before we read read the scripture, who was Nicodemus? What was his background? Pharisee, member of the Sanhedrin, the teacher of Israel. Teacher of Israel, right? So he was pretty high up there. I'm sure he was a righteous man, at least in his own eyes, right? And 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 in the eyes of his his culture. I think this is a this is a very well known passage, right? Uh, um, and this isn't original, but uh, somebody said that you know, the, the the children's programming was. Was 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 named after this the Nick at Night uh, children's program because when did when did Nicodemus come to visit Jesus at night. at night Why did he come at night Because Jesus was out there a little bit and Nicodemus is right in the, the the center of society right and he he didn't want to necessarily be seen uh, coming to talk to this guy that's kind of out there a little bit. Let's take a look at what the, the Bible says about it. Somebody read John 3, 1 through 15. Mm -hmm. 
Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it came from or where it is going. So it is, is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How, then, will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has, who has ever gone into heaven except the Son of Man, uh, I'm sorry, except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Was it through 13? Yeah. Or 50. All the way to 15. You, you'll recognize the verse yeah. if you go too far. Uh, just as this, Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Thank you. I, I really like the way Mike read that one verse. You are Israel's teacher and you do not understand these things. This guy was a seminary graduate. Okay, maybe they didn't have a seminary graduate, but he was certainly an educated man and educated in the religion of Israel, which was supposedly a God-fearing religion. So he understood what the Talmud said. He understood what the law and the prophets said. He understood these things and comes to Jesus and Jesus says, you're Israel's teacher and you do not understand these things? Well, I'm, I'm sure that same attitude could apply to many of us who think, we, well, we, we know the Bible. We've read the Bible since we were kids. We really know what's going on. And so I, 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 I'm pretty sure I know what's right and what's wrong. And I have this form of self-righteousness, right? Uh, and, and, and Jesus doesn't condemn him for it, but he certainly is a little bit perhaps even sarcastic in his, in his tone, you know, a little bit uh, like, uh, I'd say querulous, but, but that makes it sound like he doesn't realize it. He does realize what's going on. He's just saying it in such a way so that, so that Nicodemus looks at himself and says, you know, you're right. I'm really educated. I don't understand what's going on here. And that should be our attitude to a certain degree, right? I, oh, yes, I've read the Bible, but ah, there's still more I can learn. And there's more I can learn by reading the Bible further. And there's more I can learn by looking at exactly what Jesus did in his life here, since that is probably the most direct revelation of God's nature uh, to us, is, is to read those four, four uh, books of the beginning of the New Testament. So let's take a look at someone else who was self-righteous and self-righteous with a zeal. Uh, so so uh, perhaps as challenging as it is or, or as much as we should be careful about being self-righteous, we have to be a little bit careful about our zeal. Is our zeal in line with God's righteousness or is our zeal in line with our own understanding of righteousness um so somebody look up acts nine if you would please but saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the lord 
went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them down to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what to do there. Thank you. So did Paul think he was doing the wrong thing? Mm -hmm. Was he... Uh, Convinced he was doing the right thing, yep. and he was zealous, zealous about it. Excuse me. Yep. And and uh, could that possibly impact us? Could we possibly think that we're doing the right thing with our decision here, our decision there, or how how to deal with with our neighbors who might not be Christians, uh, and 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 maybe we even deal zealously with that and. And maybe it's the right thing. I'm not saying it's the wrong thing, but we got to be really careful. And that's coming back to this religious man's most challenging sin. Because clearly, here's a guy that really thought he was doing the right thing. And we have to be so careful that we really think that through uh, in, in our own lives. Right? Are we doing the right thing, even though we think it's the right uh, uh righteous thing to do so what's paul claim and this is this is the takeaway really uh, what does paul claim about his self-righteousness what's what what does how does he describe uh a, after his conversion and keep in mind nicodemus was obviously converted i, I think there's enough evidence in the bible that he was converted Paul was obviously converted. These conversions brought a whole different attitude from people. But God can, God's grace can reach out to the, what we as society will call sinners, as well as the self-righteous. So, you know, uh, even though a self-righteous attitude is a challenging sin, uh, it's not beyond God's uh, correction, shall we say. So we should always be praying for that in our own lives, right? God, uh, uh, give me wisdom uh, uh, to, to be righteous according to your word and not according to what I think is the right thing to do uh, necessarily. Um, let's just, just take away from Paul how he felt about that. Somebody take a look at Philippians, if you would. Philippians 3, I think this is also a fairly well-known section Philippians 3 and if somebody could read you know uh, I said 4 through 11 but let's let's start at verse 1 somebody read from verse 1 through verse 11 please finally my brothers rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself, having reason for confidence, in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Okay, uh, but whatever I had, <clears throat> sorry, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered, all, uh, suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. 
the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. You know, some, some passages, of course, uh, really hit you hard, and, and this is one of them. Yeah, I, I grew up in the OPC church. What more do I need to do? Right? I, I, I should be saved already, right? I, I, and, and so what should my attitude be? No, it, it, goes, it goes so much beyond that. Our own, it goes so much beyond our own self-righteousness that we have to be really, really careful. What, what does, not only does Paul consider all that self-righteousness as rubbish, he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. And I have to think to myself, how many times have I actually prayed that I could share in Jesus Christ's sufferings? Well, it's not many, I can tell you that. In fact, I think about it, I think, I really want to pray that? What if that? What if God decides to make it come true? Right? <laughs> yeah. But that should be our attitude because of the grace of Jesus Christ that has been shown to us. And that's what Paul says. And so, uh, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead, what really I think Paul's saying is that that faith he has in Jesus Christ makes him understand the fact that he's dead to his own self-righteousness and alive in Christ. And that's really the, the, the takeaway that I, I take from taking a look at these verses. Let's uh, bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for being a gracious and merciful God. We thank you that uh, it is not our own works, but in fact, uh, your will and your grace that, that, that saves us. Lord, give us uh, clearly the things to do and, and the ways to think that come from your word and not <clears throat> based on our own uh, self-righteousness. Lord, uh, we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. You can leave all the hymnals where they are. Hymnals. <laughs>